Welcome, everybody, to Survive in Advance on the Grudely True Sports Network. Survive in Advance is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. To get up to $1,000 cash, cash back on your first deposit, make sure you go to thegruelytruth.net, click on the MyBookie.ag banner at the top of the page, or you can go to MyBookie.ag and put in the promo code TGT50. I am your co-host for Survive in Advance, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I would like to welcome in 1981 national champion and the third greatest player after Norm Sloan and Kyle Guy and Lawrence Central Basketball History. Steve Risley, how you doing, Steve? Happy to be here, man. I tell you what, I'm still in the top three. As long as you stay in the top three, you're okay. You my daddy, hey, my daddy and Ricky Bobby always told me, if you ain't first, you're last. If you ain't first, you're last. Exactly. All right. And the second place is the second place is the first loser. There you and, go. And yes, and this show is full of losers today. And I'm going to start off there with a man who got to do his first NCAA basketball Final Four last night. Help me welcome to the show, Lucas Weiss. How you doing, Lucas? Mike, Steve, it's a pleasure to be on Survive in Advance again. And what a time it was in Minneapolis this weekend. Looking forward to diving into it with you guys today. All right, and of course, we've got our weekly contributor for Fan Sided and Busting Brackets. Help me welcome to the show, Brian Ralph. How you doing, Brian? I'm doing great. Shout out to everybody. I'm excited to uh, be back on and talk about what was a, one of the, I think, better championship games we've seen. All right, and of course, we've got from Indiana Sports Beat. He's now a close personal friend of Bob Knight, Jim Coyle. How you doing, Jim? Jim? I think, did we lose Jim? It sounds like somebody's being blown away in a windstorm, by the way. That would have to be Lucas because he lives in godforsaken Canada. Yeah, you're right. All right, well, Lucas, put it on mute when you're not talking then, all right? That's rude to everybody. All right, so let's start off. Last night, Virginia beats Texas Tech in overtime, 85-77. to um, Let's just get first thoughts. What, what struck you about this game? What was your big takeaway, Steve? Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was an epic battle. It was an epic defense versus an epic offense. And in one of the rare occasions, I thought, I mean, I think we have to say the offense won. Um, Virginia held their own. They, they held their game. They played to their game plan. They stuck with it. They didn't rattle. Um, Texas Tech threw everything they had at them and came back at them time after time after time. And Virginia just stuck with their game plan, and they didn't falter. And – you know, for me, this was a this was an important game for me because you're talking about Texas Tech, where, where the foundation of this program came from was Bob Knight. Now, whether Bob Knight had influence on this team or not, who knows? You know, the coach uh, at Texas Tech was an assistant coach under under Knight both the Knights, and they didn't they they they, they played Bob Knight basketball at its finest, um, better than we ever did. Uh, I would have to say, but then you've got Virginia um, that came in here that was totally a team of redemption that they needed to redeem themselves and get back after what happened last year, which was uh, you know an epic failure. So you got a team that goes um, from an epic failure to an epic success. And I, God bless Virginia. They didn't waver. They didn't falter. They stuck with themselves, and they believed in themselves. And good for them. I'm happy for them. All right. Now, when I look at this, we talk about coaching. I think both of these coaches did a great job in this tournament. And, Brian, yeah. the thing that stood out to me, Brian, was Virginia got the most out of Hunter by using him in the right lineups. Because this is a team, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're in the ACC, but they started him at small forward in a big front court next to Salt and Diakiti or whatever the hell his name is in the regular season. And it seemed like in a the tournament they downsized. They slid Hunter to the number three, or they slid Hunter from the three to the four and moved Salt to the bench. And, you know, Salt is a lot slower guy who can't really defend on the perimeter. 
And I think in the end, that foot speed to help defend the perimeter was what was the difference for this team because I think if they would have kept playing like Bennett's teams had in the past with a kid like Salt, I think that they never would have been able to accomplish this. Yeah, and it, one of the interesting things from last night was the fact that both teams went small and it became a much more perimeter-oriented game and became, I think, more fun. Both teams have their best players on the perimeter, um, but doing so allowed Virginia to slide Hunter to the four where he was going up against Jarrett Culver a lot of time where he has a major physical advantage which played Virginia's favor. Now, Tony Bennett has done this a lot, did it a lot throughout the tournament, did it at times during the regular season depending on the matchup. But he has flexibility with his roster, uh, with Jack Salt, like you mentioned, who plays a lot when they play against big teams, but he has no problem playing Jack Salt five minutes against a team that's big or a team that goes small in Texas Tech and playing Kiki Clark a lot of minutes. He, he's shown the willingness to be flexible with his rotation, and the guys seem to understand that, uh, sort of playing to what the other team wants to give him. And that versatility is something they haven't necessarily had in years past. And I think it's one of the big reasons why they were able to win not only the ACC regular season championship again, uh, but to make a tournament run and win the national title. Yeah, and I think we saw this, Lucas, even in the first round. In their first round game against Gardner-Webb, they trailed by 14 at one point, And at halftime, they were down 36-30. And I think that's when Bennett went small in the second half. And my question on that is this. College basketball and the NBA are played different ways. But I think what we saw last year was UMBC played like a modern NBA team last year. They spread the court. They pick and roll them to death against that pack line defense. And it looked to me like Bennett learned that. And Bennett, number one, kind of went to more of an NBA offense and defense himself. And do you think that that's what we're going to see in college basketball for the years to come? I think so because Virginia had success doing it. And I think that you want to emulate championship teams. And I think that the, that the teams that lost in the March Madness early on and are, and are looking ahead to next year, they want to play small. They want to, you know, do the pick and roll, spread the, spread, spread the floor out. And I think with, with, with Virginia, it was talked a lot about in press conferences with Coach Bennett and his players. Coach Bennett, Kyle Guy, and Ty Jerome had to endure that painful press conference last year losing to UMBC. And Coach Bennett told his players that let's make sure this never happens again. We don't want to repeat these emotions again. And they used that fuel all the way throughout this season and all the way through the tournament. And I said after they beat Gardner-Webb that that was going to be their toughest test in terms of just an emotional test to overcome being a 16th seed. But but before I send it back to you, Mike, last three games that Virginia won in the Elite Eight against Purdue, Purdue was up three with five seconds to go. In the final four, Auburn was up four with 17 seconds to go. And last night, Texas Tech was up three with 12 seconds to go. And all three games, Virginia won. So... We'll get into more of the game itself and and some of the, you know, not great officiating that took place. But at the end of the day, Virginia survived. And they played stellar basketball. Kyle Guy, Ty Jerome, and DeAndre Hunter combined for 57 of Virginia's 85 points last night. They were great. Congrats to Virginia. Yeah, and the thing that struck me, and Steve, you talked about Coach Knight's defenses. And and Coach Knight... If he had any failings as a coach, it was he hardly ever changed anything, especially when he was younger. I remember the 75 Indiana, Kentucky, Mideast region or Midwest regional final. And last night, the thing that struck me is the white Texas Tech plays defense. They do a lot of scrambling. And when you scramble against a team like Virginia, Kyle Guy doesn't need much to get an open shot. Neither does Jerome. And we saw them fall behind early, fell behind by 10 points. Um, And really, you saw them kind of change the lineup up. They got back in the game. Then to start the second half, they fell behind again. And then in the final eight or nine minutes, you saw guys that were basically staying with those shooters. 
And I think it was the right way to beat them. But in the end, staying with those shooters freed up Hunter underneath because if you watched the games in the past, if you threw the ball in the post and you're Gonzaga, Texas Tech looked like they had 10 guys around you. But when they had to switch this because of Jerome and Guy, it freed up Hunter to just destroy him. And Hunter was the best player on the court last night. Uh, no, no doubt. This, this was not a game about anybody that lost the game. This is about a, a team that won the game. I mean, and there's a big difference there. Uh, neither team made – they played to their strengths. Both teams did. Um, they, they played they, they played strong. And, yeah, and, and Knight's probably biggest flaw was we only had one offense. We only had one defense. And that worked for us 99% of the time. And I've got a ring to show that that works. And, but it, 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 it certainly is a, a, a game where – Okay. The wind's blowing hard in Canada at the Iditarod. Okay, it must Lucas be blowing is. hard in Canada, exactly, <laughs> where the Iditarod is. Uh, but it, it, it's a game where it was the will to win, the will to prepare to win. And both teams, I, I, I'm so proud of this basketball game. And I think there are a lot of people saying it wasn't going to be a great game. Uh, they thought it was going to be a low-scoring game. It was not going to be a very emotional game. But I, I think it was – you know, there's a lot of influence on this game on, on both sides. Um, but both teams played their, their strengths. And it, it just happened tonight or last night. Um, offensively, Virginia out offense Texas Tech's defense. And, and that's what it is. Yeah. But, yeah, well, that, 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 that was the thing. Uh, I, I think Texas Tech could not adapt to Virginia's offense is what I think happened. Um, I I think this. I think Texas Tech adapted to the offense at times when they changed things, Brian. But I think with their normal offense, it was just waiting to be beaten by guys like Jerome and Guy, Guy who just running at them and jumping is not going to stop them from knocking down a shot. Yeah, especially the first, I would say, 30 minutes of the game, there wasn't a huge awareness of where Guy and Jerome were. Texas Tech seemed to play their normal defensive strategy without focusing on a single person. And we saw guys like Guy and Jerome and Hunter get wide-open threes that they normally don't get because teams focus on them. And Texas Tech made that adjustment, and there were fewer wide-open shots later on in the game. But the difference then was DeAndre Hunter kind of took over. And Virginia's offense is, is fine. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they play with, with a kind of efficiency that got them to this point. Uh, but we saw late in the game when Texas Tech, Texas Tech made that comeback, instead of just playing a methodical uh, slice you up set, kind of like, like Virginia normally does, where they just take their time to find great shots, they waited to get into their sets. And so they were rushing late in shot clocks and, and forcing shots, and that's why they kind of got stagnant late in that game. The big difference was Hunter took over. And he's uh, we talked about this earlier on in the season – He's the kind of player, the kind of mismatch that Virginia hasn't had in the past. And his ability to make tough shots, get tough shots in that game uh, against an NBA caliber defender in Culver, one of the best defenses in the country, uh, I think proved to be the difference in that game. All right, Lucas, you can go ahead and unmute it so we can hear the wind. No, I'm kidding. But Lucas, <laughs> the, the thing that stuck out, uh, stuck out to me, though, at the end of that game, and this is getting kind of old to me. Even with all the instant replays in the world, why is it that whether it's football, basketball, doesn't matter what the sport is, why is there always a controversial call that has not gotten right? I have no idea. And it's sad because instant replay, is, it was instituted to get the calls right. We have had intense debates on the show. You and Steve have. I've been there. And the purpose of instant replay is to get the calls right. It's to have integrity of the game. And the first instant replay they did in regulation, they got right. It was inconclusive. But then in overtime, right, you know, you know, Texas Tech gets the steal. They're driving down the floor. Ball goes out of bounds, but it, 
it, it was inconclusive. Like from where I was sitting in the press area, down on the court, looking up at the monitor, there was no way that the refs could say that that was conclusive, that it went off of Texas Tech. There's just no way. Right. And whether you, whether you like it or not, you know, we could talk about the Kyle Guy trip that happened beforehand. Yeah, that's and, even and worse that, because – That's it, even worse. Yeah, because we'll go, to, we'll go back to Brian real quick, and then we'll come back to you, Lucas, and then Steve. But, number one, did you think the last play that was called there was inconclusive, Brian? And number two – what about the Kyle Guy play? And my big question on the Kyle Guy play is this. They replay everything on CBS. They didn't replay that. They didn't even mention that after it happened. And that was the one of the more egregious calls you're going to see in a big situation. Yeah, that trip was the, the bigger missed call, in my opinion. The, the other one I thought was conclusive, it went off Texas Tech. And you can argue the merits of going back and reviewing that because in, in every instance that's off Virginia Hunter hitting that ball away instead of rolling off of Moretti's pinky uh, at the end. But I, I thought if you're went frame by frame, frame, frame by frame, excuse me, I, I thought it was conclusive that it grazed off Moretti's hand at the very end there. So I didn't mind that call. I thought that was a, actually a good call. The guy trip was the more concerning one for me because uh, going back on replay, it was very clear that he tripped over his own guy and that Texas Tech wasn't necessarily around him to cause that. Now, I will say watching that live, uh, I didn't catch that. I didn't even think twice about it, and I think the same thing probably happened with CBS. I know Jim, Man- Jim Nance mentioned on the broadcast earlier in the game where he called a Jarrett Culver shot that was very clearly a two. He called it a three and then went back and talked about how the fact that they're essentially in a dugout broadcasting the game and they can't necessarily see where everything is on the court which is, a, I think, a bigger problem that needs to be addressed when it comes to broadcasting these games. But if I didn't see it on TV that clearly, I don't know if necessarily everybody in the arena saw it very clear, very clearly. They just saw him fall uh, in between three guys, and the automatic thought is, okay, he trips, that's a foul, uh, move on. And so I don't think anybody necessarily gave it a second thought. Wait a second, though, tripped. Brian. Wait a second. It doesn't matter if I see it or you see it or Lucas sees it at the game or if Steve sees it at the game, the referee is standing right there. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to admonish the referee. The referee should have seen that. I'm saying in terms of why a bigger deal was made that on the broadcast and different things is because uh, for people who weren't right there, like the ref was, who should have seen it, it didn't look wrong. The fact that he called the foul. Well, I can tell you this. I watched it. And I thought it looked wrong because this is the other thing. If he did trip, that's not a foul unless you're trying to trip him. If your foot's there and he steps on it, that's not a foul, correct? Well, if you're if you're running, but nobody was running. Like, I mean, the dude was standing well, in front of him. I, I, I from what, watching it live, I thought Moretti, who I think the foul was on, was called on, was running behind him, and I thought that too ended up tripping him. Uh, watching it live. But see, my, my point is this. When you see anything else in a college game or an NFL game, so what you're telling me is you don't think anybody went back and rewatched that to see if there was anything wrong with it. Because I remember watching a 60 Minutes piece like two years ago where they've got it and they're following the crews around. And there's like 500 people there looking at it, what mm-hmm. happened in the last minute to see if there was something screwy. I just don't remember seeing something that's that big a call because that's what? About halfway through overtime, Texas Tech's up three. It ends up being, what, a tie game or, t- or Texas Tech up one where mm-hmm. that is possibly, if Texas Tech go down and hits a three, that's a seven-point swing on one call. And my thing is this. The official is standing right there. He is right mm-hmm. behind it. He can see it. And on the conclusive or not, to me, on the instant replay, if you have to slow it down and move it really, really slow, and then you think that might have – I don't think any of us know 100% for sure if that hits his hand or not because a ball can go right underneath your hand and look like it hit it. And my point is this also. I don't think instant replay should be done unless you can look at that in about 10 seconds and know. Because if you have to all of a sudden slow stuff down frame by frame, nothing's going to be conclusive. When you, you look at it for five minutes, you can make the damn thing look like anything. 
I I think the importance of instant replay uh, is crucial in games like that. I think the how little the ball touched Moretti is, is the thing that is, is causing this more than the fact that the inconclusiveness or not, because I, I thought it was, conclusive. I originally thought it, it was very clearly just off Hunter and we should move on. But when you slowed it down frame by frame, I, I thought it was pretty clear that it did go off Moretti. And I think that's why the, the referees changed their call. I, I think there should be a time limit. And I think we talked about this last week or two weeks ago. There should be a time limit where after, you know, one or two minutes, whatever you want to make that, that it's just automatically ruled inconclusive and you move on to kind of keep the game moving and keep a game from getting bogged down and extremely long and necessary replays. But in that one particular instance, I think slowing it down did get it right. All right. So we'll go this way. Lucas, do you think the ball touched Moretti or do you think it didn't? Or are you unsure? I'm 100% with you, Mike. I think it was inconclusive. And, and I think that in the time in the game, I agree with you, Brian. A time limit makes sense. You know, you want the flow of the game to keep continuing. It was tense. It was epic. It was thrilling. And you don't want it to be slam shot. You don't want it to just be slowed down, put the foot on the gas, on, on the brake, bogged down looking at instant replay. And you have to take that long. I don't know. From where I was, it looked inconclusive to me. And then when you look at what happened afterwards, obviously I know what Steve's going to say. They're going to need to respond. They were only down. They were only uh, down by two points. It was still a ball game. But at the end of the day, Virginia just took over, and, and, and Texas Tech was deflated after that point. And to me, with instant replay, you just got to get the calls right. Mike, you hit the nail on the head. It doesn't matter what we think. These are the best referees, supposedly, in college basketball. And they need to make those right calls. All right, Steve, real quick. Lucas didn't understand when I said, give me a quick answer. Steve, did you think that the ball was touched by Moretti? Do you think it was out on on Virginia, or do you think it was inconclusive? It, it was inconclusive, but I think more importantly, this I I don't I'm not a fan of this replay, Mike. You know, you and I have had this debate since the day we got together and started doing the show. Uh, the, the, the sports is a game of opportunity and adversity, and you make the most out of both opportunities. You either deal with adversity or you take advantage of opportunity. And I don't like instant replay period. I wish it was not a part of sports. So you don't want the calls to be right. You just want to dick around and let these officials be made. Whatever referees make the calls like Uh the basketball is inflated at 8.5 pounds or nine pounds or whatever, Uh you know, and you know, and your shoe breaks down in the middle of a game, and you deal with shit that happens to you in a game. It's opportunity and adversity. And the more you put into the sport of this microcosm of electronic media, the more I think you take away from the, 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 the romance of the sport. That's just my feeling. Now, I'm the oldest one on this, on this call right now. And I'm the oldest one on this show. So that's how I feel. We didn't have it. We, we had nothing. So you, you're fine with the calls being screwed up. I mean, it doesn't matter. The kids worked their I'm, ass I'm, off. I'm, they work for free know, for the NCAA no, 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 who gets paid. No, no. This, this whole thing is okay, a joke, I, I think. I, I, it's just a joke. I, I can't finish my I, statement. We, we I watched the statement. Well, because you, I thought you did because I know what you mean. And I just think it's utter bull Yeah, crap. no. It, sport is all about mm. being a gladiator, getting in the oh, coliseum, no, it's and not. playing and it's going after it. A gladiator and in a coliseum. It, Who got beheaded last night? I mean, did Texas Tech get eaten because they lost the game? No. It's a freaking basketball game. <laughs> and this is the thing. Everybody that plays in that basketball game since they were four years old dribbled a ball for this moment in time. And in that moment of time, right. some old white dude screwed it up. you win or you lose. Oh, you bullshit. win or you lose. No, this is the thing. It's not you win or you lose. Not when you let other people decide the game. Let the players decide the game. You, when you have an official standing right there and the call is not made, 
And then you have CBS, which will not show an instant replay of it. Never have. They don't now. You know, I, I mean, I haven't really watched TV this morning, but as of midnight, 2 o'clock, two hours after the game, this hasn't even been addressed. And when this is not addressed and nobody says, look at this call, unless they're a Texas Tech fan who scream about it because they rightfully should, it tells me something's wrong here. And you know what else tells me something wrong here is when we have Rashad McCants on to talk about what North Carolina did, but yet North Carolina's playing in a freaking tournament. So to sit here and think that the NCAA all of a sudden is on the up and up when we don't even see this talked about, I mean, two or three hours after, it makes me wonder what's going on. Now, I think this, I think 99% that the officials are probably just incompetent because when we look back at the Final Four, though, What team got the benefit of the call? The double dribble that was not called should be called by anybody that's a college official. Correct, Brian? But, but, but Mike, Mike, no, wait, wait, wait. No, before Brian, what have I not said? 51.1% of the stuff is luck. That's bullshit. Uh, You get the right call. That's bullshit. No, wait a second, Steve. Don't give me the luck thing. You've been there. You know what? Hey, you you know what, Risley? Did they ask you to vote for the coach of the year or the All-American team? Everybody on here, they did. So why don't they respect your opinion more? Because you got a freaking ring. Because I have a freaking ring. Yeah, you have a freaking ring. So does Chuck Franz. But you know what? He don't send me pictures of it. I mean, I don't need to hear that you got a ring because I hate to tell you this. I introduced you as a 1981 national champion. So it's obvious everybody here knows you have a ring. You can't sit here and tell us you have knowledge about what's going on today because you won a ring 300 years ago. It was actually 38 years ago. Same damn thing. It's just like dog gears. I got some breaking news. I got some breaking news. (laughs) The call's been overturned and they're replaying the game tonight. (laughs) No. No, no, no! I, 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 I wait a oh, second. I, I Lucas has breaking news. news. We're sitting here. We're sitting here. Tell us we're the news. We're arguing about. We're arguing wow. about. Brian, what's your what breaking? Or great... Lucas, what's the breaking news? All right, I'm done. Since, All right. Cincinnati's head coach Mick Cronin has now become the new UCLA head coach. So, Brian, that means UCLA is still not serious about winning tournament games. Uh, it means it's the best they could get because everybody else turned it down. <laughs> yeah, it's a shit job. You don't want you don't want UCLA. Why? I live out here. Why would you want UCLA? Because you can't. No, nobody gives a damn out here. They, they don't care. It, it, it's it's a no win situation. Really? Because they've it's, won it's like, multiple I, if, national if I, if champions I was any since John Wooden. Coach in the world, I would not want to coach UCLA because they don't. It's almost as bad as Indiana. Uh, not quite. Oh, so now uh, UCLA yeah. is worse than Indiana or not as bad yeah. as Indiana? I spent two years with Steve Alford out here, and I, I, I went to practice. I went to games. I, I, went, I, I spent time in his locker room, and he had no chance. How about this? I mean, Do you think maybe he had he, no chance because he couldn't coach that well? That, that, and that has a lot to do with it, too, Mike. Yes. And right. Steve, you're if right. you're listening to the show, I apologize. We still want you on in a month. Go ahead. <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, anyway. I, I, I don't know. Brian, you know more about this than I do because, you know, you're younger and pay more attention. Is UCLA a good job or a bad job? UCLA is still a good job. It's still the flagship program on the West Coast. But it is not, not a good, good a, job. It is but it's not, not a good job. Good a, it's not as good of a job as the other blue blood, blue blood programs or well, necessarily in that top tier right now. It can be. I mean, it, it could certainly get back to that point, but it would require a bigger investment from the school, which kind of shown by them not buying out Jimmy Dixon's contract at TCU, that they are necessarily willing to make that significant investment. So, in that sense, it's not as good of a job as a lot of these other top jobs, but the brand name and the history and just their standing in the Pac-12 and on the West Coast still makes it a good job when you're looking at the national landscape. 
All right, Lucas, what's your well, opinion? Good job or bad job? I think UCLA became, you know, when, when John Wooden left, they just declined. And their, their overall success declined, too, which calls into question, Mike, what you've talked about with John Wooden and all his controversy, you know. It, it makes you think. It makes you think. Well, I think and, UCLA has been fairly successful since Wooden. They've won a few. I have they won it, since Wooden? Yeah. I mean, Jim Herrick won it, didn't he, um, Brian? Uh, I think Steve Lavin won in 95, which was the last one. Uh, ben Hallen took him to three straight Final Fours a decade ago. Um, you know, they lost a, they lost a ball year under Alford was a good year for UCLA. Uh, in terms of what you would look at and all the measures of a good program. So they have compared been able to, to the maintain, other program. Huh? Yeah, they, they have been able to maintain a consistent level of success outside of those three straight years under Hallam where they made the Final Four. Yeah, but my, my point is this. If you look at it, 76, they make the Final Four. 80 under Larry Brown, they make the Final Four. They made it three years under Hallen. They won a national championship in that time. So I think this, I think it goes back to this, and it all goes back to this, is the fact that if you're a really good coach, anywhere you go, you're going to win. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just my opinion. But, I mean, if you look at them, they've had five Final Four or six, what, six Final Four appearances since – John Wooden left. And the other thing is this, Steve. Maybe you can find another car dealer in UCLA and you can have a dynasty like John Wooden. <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah. Now, I'm telling you, I uh, in the two years I've lived out here, I went to two USC-UCLA games and Pauly Pavilion was not sold out. And yeah, but if you're I not any good, think, if you're not any good, it's not going to sell out. Statement. I cannot finish the statement. Go ahead. Finish, go ahead. Finish me up. No, go ahead and finish. I don't want you to go get ahead, all Mike. upset. And Go ahead. No, I'm not upset. I'm just saying I, I can never remember going to an IU-Purdue game when the place wasn't packed and sold out. And I tried to get two tickets for a friend of mine to the IU-Purdue game. And, I, you know, it was a str- I got it done, but it was a struggle. You go come out here to Pauly for USC UCLA uh, crosstown rivals and Pauly Pavilion's half full. I'm at the game. You know it, it's it's not that big a deal anymore out here, and I think UCLA is a hellhole and unless I was a young Mark Few or a young coach that was trying to make a mark, I wouldn't touch this job with anything in the heart. Because, you know, Alford, not a great coach. I get that. I'll buy that. But he had no chance to win out here. Uh, nobody cared. They just didn't care. This is because a they sold out on the West Coast. And USC, oh, UCLA yeah. was never a big basketball rivalry unless it would have been in the 60s or the 70s. I mean, nobody cares well, about USC and UCLA. That's a football rivalry. And most people don't care about that anymore because it's L.A., which means your rivalry only counts if both teams are good. It's not like it's Cincinnati Xavier or Duke Carolina. It's still a rivalry. I mean, it, you're never going to find a Purdue IU game where you're not going to see, or North Carolina Duke game where it's not sold out, no matter how bad. Yeah, either because one of the those two are all are. basketball schools. You will also not find this. You won't find many Duke Carolina <laughs> football games that are sold out either. And UCLA holds the most national championships of any team in the country. It's not a basketball school. Really, Mike? Seriously? No, it's not. I, I think this. Okay. I, I think if you look there at it, they go. were a basketball school wow. when Wooden was there. But wow. UCLA, yeah, to wow. me, what I think wow. UCLA. Thank you. I can't thank believe you. that. I, I think when you think yeah. UCLA, you thank usually you think of football. <laughs> I, what? Mike. Yeah. Mike you, uh, USC. Mike, USC Mike, you're, you're, I, Mike, I, Mike, you're, you're going deep. Wait now. a second! You just told me, Steve, <laughs> you're going deep that now, UCLA Mike. is a basketball school, <laughs> but you just told me it was a bad job because nobody comes to the games. Which one is it? No, it's a it's, it's a program that's gone south and gone I south. Know. So and it's, I, I would not I would not school. be a reputable coach and come here and want to try and resurrect UCLA. 
it's not a job for a coach who's already got his reputation at stake and got his, his place in game. I wouldn't come here for that. Alford tried it. He failed. Uh, other guys have tried it. Some guys did okay, and but it's 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 a hellhole out here. It's not a place to come to. And you can't dispute the basketball history. Either. Yeah, I can because and, uh, because well, what I'm being told <laughs> that there's no basketball history there now because nobody shows up. I don't know how we can get mad if I say it's more of a football school. I didn't school. say that, Mike. I did yeah. not. Say you said that. it was a basketball I said school it was a program. It's What's one of the most much similar? Yeah, go to Indiana. It's, it's, Look at Indiana. Yeah, look at Indiana. Right. What same about pro, a, same situation? Same it is? similar situation. If it was a similar situation, exactly. how many empty seats were there when Indiana played their natural rival, Purdue? There were none. You already said that. It's hard to get tickets. It's not hard to get tickets to USC, UCLA basketball. And what I think of UCLA over the last 20 years, I mean, actually, I don't really think of UCLA over the last 20 years, Brian. What do you think? <laughs> I think, well... There's there's no denying that the fan base at UCLA is not as rabid uh, or as intense as most of the other top programs like in Indiana, like a Duke, like a UNC. And that's a problem that they've always had and tends to come from their location in Los Angeles and the fact that there's a lot of other things to do in Los Angeles and it's not necessarily exactly. a college town. But at the, at the same time, mm-hmm. The level of success or the, the standard for success at UCLA is so high that mm-hmm. uh, when they haven't met it for an extended period of time, kind of like they're in now, you'll see those problems like fans on the show because they expect to be good. And when they're not, it's easy to not necessarily get behind and support them in, in, in the way you see it from an Indiana, from a Duke, from a Carolina, those kind of schools. UCLA so starts winning again, all the fans will come back. We saw that as I mentioned, the, the Lonzo Ball year where they were really good and they were selling out for life and, and everything was kind of uh, back, not in the same sense as it is at other schools, but the issues they're having now weren't issues then. Everything will take care of itself as long as UCLA is winning. The problem is that they're not winning and they're not necessarily putting themselves in a position to win at the level that they're expecting to win at. Well, and since 1976, they have made 33 tournaments and 18 Sweet 16s. So I don't think they've been that bad. But my point is this. USC, UCLA is strictly a football rivalry. I don't remember even when I was growing up in the late 70s being all geeked up to see UCLA play as US, USC in basketball. But football was another story. I mean, that's... That's to me. USC UCLA is not a rivalry because UCLA hadn't, or USC hasn't really been relevant at all. Basketball was. And I get your point. I get your point, Mike. I get your point. But it's still, it, it's a it's a crosstown rivalry. I mean, these schools are twenty miles apart from each other. They are, you, you know, they're they're like they're like Indiana Purdue. I mean, it, it's it's the same mentality. It's like Duke North Carolina. They yeah, but it's like Indiana and Purdue playing close. football, Steve. That's not a rivalry. People act like it is, no. but it's not. Okay, you're you're right. You're right. But I was I would still think that the school rivalries exist, but maybe they don't out here. They they don't out here well, because we have beaches. We we have canyons. We can go hike. We have beaches. We got coyotes. We got to go fight. Coyotes. Um, you know. They're, they're, Yo, God, yeah, there's coyotes in my coyotes backyard Coyotes are every sharks. Night. Make Shit. up your are damn you mind. I'll tell you. Hey, what happens coyotes, if a coyote no. bites a shark? Does a shark just eat it immediately? Uh, don't ever <laughs> screw with a shark. Trust me. I'll never screw with a shark. I'll take a coyote on any time. But I, I just don't think they don't care out here. And I think that UCLA is just, you know, I, I wouldn't touch this job with a 10-foot pole unless I was a young coach. Um, who had nothing to lose and everything to gain by coming out here and building something out of this program. If I was a name brand coach, I wouldn't come to UCLA for a ten dollar bill. I wouldn't do it. I would because I think that's a name brand coach. Alford should, should have never left New Mexico. He should have stayed there. He'd have been fine there, you know. And now he's out of a job. Well, all and I know he's is not this. a great basketball coach. I get that for you. I get that. 
but he should have stayed where he was and built his program and made something out of that rather than try and think you're going to resurrect UCLA. You're not going to, you're never going to live up to John Wooden. You're never going to live up to Bob Knight. It's just, you're never going to Dean Smith. It's just not going to happen. Those Wait are a legends second. In the I think game. Roy Williams has done a decent job. Yeah, Roy, Roy's been great for us. Three national championships, not bad. How many did Dean win? Two. In a lot more years. But, and you got to give Steve Alford this, though. He made a lot of money at UCLA. And there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, so God. I would call it I would call it a success if I'm if I'm him. Because how many years would it take him to make that kind of money at New Mexico, Brian? More than what he spent at UCLA, that's for sure. <laughs> so I've uh, actually seen Steve Alford's house and it's nice, trust me. It's see? Nice. I told you so Steve made a wise choice. <laughs> that's fine. Um uh, let's look at this because I think at one point the show was about the NCAA championship game. It was played last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But as always, get we get off on a tangent. Really. I agree. Um, yeah. So let's look at this, Brian. When you look ahead to next year right now, who are the teams that stand out outside of the normal powers or which normal powers really stand out that you think are going to be really good next year? I think Michigan State has to go in as the top team. They're going to return pretty much everybody outside of Kenny Gullins and Matt McQuaid. Cassius Winston's the guy who's sort of on the bubble there, but he's not projected to be a first-round pick, so I would expect him back as well. With all that core back from making the Final Four this year and uh, assuming they get healthy and stay healthy next year, I think they enter at least as a team to beat. Louisville's going to be really good. They were going to return most of their lineup as well and bring in a top recruiting class. Duke's always going to be good, especially now that Trey Jones is staying. UNC uh, may take a small step back, but with their recruiting class, especially if they can land Cole Anthony, is going to be really good as well. You can't write off Texas Tech and Virginia. Virginia's going to lose DeAndre Hunter. may lose Ty Jerome as well. Uh, there's a potential Ty Jerome's a, a first-round pick, so we'll see kind of what happens with him and Kyle Guy. But Bennett has built that program in a way that's going to maintain success same thing with Texas Tech. They're going to lose Jared Culver. They're going to lose some of their grad chancers. But given the way Beard rebuilt that program this year, I'm not going to write them off either. Kansas is in an interesting place in the Big 12. I think they'll be good. Uh, but a lot of that depends on the development of guys like Quentin Grimes, what happens with them. They lose Lawson Another, too, don't they? Yeah, they, they, Lawson went pro and, and the other Lawson transferred. So they're, they have some holes but have a good amount of returning talent. It's just a matter of how much that, that grows and the incoming freshman class, how how much they're able to contribute right away. Villanova is another team to watch, too. They're, they lose Phil Booth. They lose Eric Pascal. And Javon Quinterly is transferring, but he didn't play a role for them this year anyway. And they're bringing in another top recruiting class. So they're, they're a team to watch. I really like Georgetown. Uh, sorry to kind of ramble on here. I'll, I'll, no, I, I think really like it's Georgetown. good because I think the Big East, what you saw this year, was a lot of young teams that are mm-hmm. all going to be pretty good. Now, I think next year you could have six teams from the Big East make the tournament. Yeah, the Villanova's going to be right up there. Marquette doesn't necessarily lose anybody significant. Marcus Howard's going to be back, which matters for them. Georgetown loses Jesse Govan, but essentially everybody else is back in the freshman backcourt of James Akinjo, Mac McClung, I think both of them could take the next step forward this year. Seton Hall brings, should bring everybody back. Miles Powell said he expects to go back to school. If that happens, Seton Hall is going to be a top 20, top 15 team. So there are a lot of these good – there's going to be a lot of, of good teams next year. I don't know necessarily how many great teams there are going to be, but there's going to be a lot of good teams, that, and as you mentioned, like, especially in that Big East. Yeah, I think they'll be a lot stronger right, than I, what they were this year. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Brian, I have a question. What's the strongest conference right now? Um, Big Ten, ACC, Big East. Who is the strongest conference right now looking at next year? At the top, I would still say, well, at the top of the ACC is going to have Duke, going to have UNC, going to have Virginia. Uh, But the Big Ten is going to have Michigan State and Michigan both are at the top of the polls. Uh, There's a good chance they both – end up in the top three in the in the preseason top 25. What about Purdue? Definitely both in the top five. 
Purdue will be up there in the top 25, but if Edwards doesn't come back, assuming that, that he's gone, I think people are going to be in a wait-and-see kind of mode with the rest of that roster. So that'll be – and it'll be interesting to see, too, at the ACC how high Louisville ends up because some people have them in the top 10, some people have them in the back end in the top 25. Uh, but at, at the very, very top, the Big Ten has it. I think the ACC has the most depth of good teams. And with what the SEC, I think, has going on right now and the hires that, that the four schools who had openings have made – the SEC might end up being the deepest conference next year, top to bottom. And what's your take on Rick Barnes? That was pretty smart of him to get more money out of Tennessee that way, huh? Yeah, I don't know if he seriously considered going to UCLA. I, I don't think he did. Of, yeah, I know that was the story, but I think his his plan, I think it would have been fine going to UCLA. I think in his mind he was okay accepting that, but what he wanted was to use that to get more money out of Tennessee, which he ultimately got. Now, I got a question for Lucas and a question for Steve. I'm going to start with Steve first. When you watched last night the player introductions in the video right before the players come out, could you see Coach Knight maybe doing a little dance on that video before they introduce you guys the way that, you know, Beard did? No. <laughs> you think he just walked no. out with his arms folded looking pissed? Yeah, I think he would have walked out. Yeah, or do you think he, he just would have refused to do it? <laughs> uh, he was focused on the game and winning the game and getting crap done he needed to do to get us ready to play. And yeah, no, that's not a Bob Knight thing. You got to put <laughs> on a show nowadays, though. And, and speaking of the show, yeah, Lucas, I know. Yeah, I, I know. The last few years, I went to the first two rounds of the tournament and the first four. I know you got to go to the final four for the first time this year and the regionals. I went to the regionals, and I would like to say this. I've been to the Super Bowl. I've been to World Series. Um, the NCAA tournament, though, and especially when you get to the Sweet 16, I don't think there's any place you can be with more energy or more electricity than a Sweet 16 Final Four, basically the NCAA tournament itself. Yeah. You know, Mike, it's it's one of the events that I pinpoint on my calendar every year as one of the best. I've been following this. The first ever NCAA championship that I remember was 2003, Carmelo oh, God, Anthony. God, shut Steve. up. 2003. <laughs> Jeez. Me and Steve <laughs> Wait, remember when the championship, it's, they had to use a saw to cut the net down because it was a peach basket. <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, but anyway. My point is that, you know, I've watched this tournament consistently and it's exciting. And what I, and, and being at the regional final and being at the, the final four national championship is the energy from the crowd. You're right, Mike. It's just palpable. I mean, I'm here in Toronto and we are a hockey city, of course. And we're big on the Toronto Maple Leafs. And those games are way quieter than the March Madness, the Final Four, the National Championship. And I think a big part of that is the students that go. These students flock to Minneapolis or to Kansas City or to Louisville, in your case, to show support for their team. And what I love is just the raw emotion that these kids show. It's genuine. And you look at last night when the confetti fell. What a contrast from the Virginia kids who are jumping into each other's arms with happiness and then the Texas Tech players who were obviously very emotional and losing. And I look forward to covering more of these events because the story, the story, the journey, like Steve was saying earlier on shows previous, you just can't beat it. And these are memories for the players, for the coaches, for the members of the media that will stay with you for the rest of your life. And the great thing about it is, is that next year we're going to do this all over again. More great memories, more great history will be made. But I don't know about you, but this is one of the best tournaments that I've seen from the Sweet 16 onward. 
Oh, from the Sweet 16 I, I, onwards? Okay, I, I, and I, I don't got, know if I, I remember I anything statement. better. I got one statement. I got one statement and then one comment. Uh, one, one question. Last night was a life-altering moment, and I know that because I, I, yeah. I we want it. It's a life-altering moment in, in your life for Virginia, all the kids on that team. I don't care if, if you're the if you're Kyle guy or the 12th guy on the team. It's a life-altering moment for you. Trust me, I know that. And and secondly, you know, and, and, and to win that damn thing, and I, I could never have imagined having lost, gone to the championship game and lost. I, I could never have imagined – what that would have felt like. I, I don't ever want to ever even endear thinking what that was like. And so it's a life altering moment for Virginia last night. Those kids on that team, their life changed. It changed. They're going to get jobs. They're going to get recognized. They're going to get opportunities. And it's all going to pay off for them, whatever they do. And there may be one or two players that play in the NBA after that. I don't know. Um, but then. Um, secondly, Brian, are you on Brian? Yep. Are you are, is, is, are they cleaning house? I mean, they've dumped four players already. Is Indiana university just cleaning house and just saying, you know, you know, I'm going to do my own thing now and I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to create my own universe. What is IU doing right now? Because they've lost a bunch of players that have left the program. Uh, I think some of that may have to do with just kind of the season that happened. Uh, maybe some of them didn't like the direction things were going under Archie Miller. Uh, I mean, there was clearly some dysfunction with that group this year, and that's kind of why things went south. And take those things have a tendency to build on themselves as well when losing's involved. So it's not necessarily, I mean, it, it is surprising, but it's not, um, it's understandable, I guess. The diff, I, I think next year is certainly going to be a very, very crucial year for Archie Miller's future there because of all this turmoil and the fact that they didn't win last year as well as they were expected to. Okay. So here's my next question. To add on to that, um, Bob Knight returns to a, to a Bloomington. He goes to a baseball game, and we all saw that. And and we we broadcast it on the net. He comes back. He's moving. The, the alleged story is he's moving back to Bloomington, Indiana. Now we haven't validated that yet, so I want to be careful with that, whether he is or not. Uh, but he comes back, and then is Michael Lewis you know, from Nebraska, is he a great fit to get into the IU program and kind of create some kind of resurgence in the IU program? Well, they need something. They need something. I, I know they were counting on, on Archie being that guy that could generate some of that. And again, it kind of well, yeah, Archie's the head coach. Thing. Yeah. But Mike well, was well, just a coach. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it kind of goes back. I mean, he, he can certainly help. He can, he can certainly help. Um, it, it, this is the case for, for everybody, but it kind of goes back to the UCLA thing, too. Uh, no matter what Indiana does or doesn't do, uh, it's only going to be the right decision if they win on the court at, at a high level. And he can come in and be successful with recruiting and, and helping with the on-court strategy and everything like that, but – if it doesn't lead to wins, it's, it's not going to matter. They, whether he does a good job and they lose or he does a bad job and they win, they just need to win. And then I, I think everybody around that program will, will feel confident uh, in it moving forward. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that the program needs right now is just some positive momentum. Okay, so here's my $10 question. This year, the season's over. We we, we crowned a champion. Um, what programs gained and what programs lost this year? Can you reflect on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I don't think Indiana necessarily falls into either category. Just keeping with the Hoosiers, I they just they stayed the way they've the been. Yeah, yeah, and that. No, no, you know, don't, worry about the, don't worry about the Hoosiers. Yeah, just talk about. 
what programs succeeded. Yeah. And, I mean, Texas Tech obviously elevated themselves hugely. Um, right. Auburn, you know, so go through what what you think the teams were that succeeded this year and got themselves elevated. What programs like Kentucky kind of flopped on themselves once again. So go through that process for us. And Mike, well, I'm sure Tech. you're going to have a comment on Kentucky. No, I, well, I, I actually Tech. thought Kentucky went about as far as their talent should have taken them. I think uh, I think Texas Tech certainly put themselves in an elite tier, and Chris Beard put himself in an elite tier with, with what they did. Uh, Kansas, they have to look at as a huge disappointment. Uh, same thing with Arizona, taking a, a huge step back, and we'll see kind of what happens with Sean Miller at the FBI trial uh, that's coming up here in a few weeks. But they took a major step back. The entire Pac-12 really took a took a major step back, opening the door. I think that just as a conference, the American took a step forward. Uh, Houston is another school that, that kind of stepped forward like Texas Tech did and are going to be a program that I think is going to remain relevant for a while, or at least as long as, as Kelvin Sampson's there. Um, you know, Memphis, I think, took a step forward in a Penny Hardaway. Uh, there, there were a lot of schools that I think took steps forward in a positive direction. Louisville is another one of those that, even though they didn't win a game in the NCAA tournament, overachieved this year and it's kind of set the table for a big year next year. So uh, those would be my, my three Texas tech uh, Louisville and, uh, and Houston that, that kind of took the major steps forward this year uh, and have made themselves teams to watch on a yearly basis. Moving forward. Okay. How, how about this as um, a team that took a step back just because of the coaching situation, LSU, because I think they were bordered on looking at a great future, and then that seems like it's kind of been snatched with the coach being basically let go. Well, they that's another one, kind of like Arizona. I think Arizona took the biggest step back of anybody this year. Yeah. LSU, LSU will be interesting to see what ends up happening with Will Wade uh, because there, there's a report that he has new representation now, uh, and him and LSU are working on a potential return for him depending on what comes out of the, the FBI trial, of course. So there's a, there's a real chance that he's back on the sidelines there next year. And their success moving forward will depend on that, but also who stays and who leaves for the NBA draft, because virtually their entire starting lineup has declared for the draft. Uh, not all of them should stay in, but of course we, we know that that's not always the leading factor in a player's decision in, in going pro. So, I'm still in a wait-and-see mode with LSU. They certainly took a step forward in terms of relevancy nationally, but they can definitely take a step back moving forward depending on what happens with Will Wade and and some of the decisions some of their players have with regards to the NBA draft. All right. I've got about about three more questions. Romeo Langford, should he go pro or should he stay at IU? He should go pro. His, His draft stock says so, I think, as a player. He probably needs another season of polishing, but the NBA team is going to go to is going to give him that, whether it be, uh, you know, a short stint in the G league or in some minutes <laughs> off the bench, his draft status basically dictates the fact that he should leave. Yeah. Because by next year he may never get drafted because he's soft and aloof <laughs> and he's useless, but go ahead. Agreed. Agreed. I can say it now. The season's over with, and he already said he's leaving. So yeah. <laughs> that's what I thought about him all year. And you can ask Steve. That's what I thought before he got there. He's soft. He just. I don't, I don't think know, Mike. I agree with NBA, you, Mike. You're, you're, but you're, you're spot on. Yeah, I, I agree with you entire time. Okay, uh, Mike Bonatti, Duke, Nike, money paid. Brian, do you have a comment on that, or do you want to touch it, or you want to leave it alone until it? comes out or uh I, mean, I it, think this is a real deal i think this is a real deal i i think there's when there's smoke there's fire and i think there's a lot of fire burning right now and i think the ncaa is going to have to deal with this in a way they don't want to deal with it what's your thoughts or do you want to have a thought on it well i mean it certainly wouldn't be a surprise uh, this is kind of what we've seen the way business has been done and uh, if you just thought it was an Adidas thing or a Louisville thing, it is naive to think that. So it certainly wouldn't be a surprise. And at the same time, this is somewhat of a flawed messenger. Uh, oftentimes, though, those are the people who are the only ones kind of telling the truth. 
in matters like this because they don't have anything to necessarily lose. But because of his uh, credibility issues, so to speak, uh, it's probably going to need to be validated by a different source before it becomes um, anything super, super real. But it absolutely would not be a surprise. My question is this. How much did he supposedly get paid? Uh, that, uh, if it was anything worth his market value, uh, we should see a couple commas in there. So I would say this. I have no problem if he got paid. I think he should have. I think Duke should have been paying him because they made a lot of money off the kid. I think the NCAA should pay him and CBS because they made a lot of money off the kid. So I don't really care. Oh, yeah, and that, that's the tricky thing with all of this stuff is um, most of us can agree that the players deserve to be compensated in some form or fashion. Uh, it's just a matter of how and who's doing it and which school is doing it because if it's your school, you 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 know you said the players deserve to get paid, but if it's Duke or your rival, then tell me they're the biggest See, this is the, the thing. World, right? I, I think everybody should get paid, and, and this is what it is. Alex Gray, who does the NASCAR show with Steve, is in the pep band at NKU. The NKU basketball team flew to play Texas Tech. They got beat in the first round 72-57. to 57, And as soon as the game was over, they put all the kids back on a plane and flew them back home immediately. I mean, it's not like the, they, they don't treat these kids the way they should be treated. And I'm not talking about necessarily the pep band, but the team was flown back right away too. I mean, mm-hmm. can't we treat them a little bit better than that? Can't we, as the NCAA, have a little bit more respect for the people that are making us all the money? I mean, I, I just find this sad. And I love the NCAA basketball tournament. And I, I love college sports. But it just makes me sick what I know what actually goes on. And who profits off of this and who doesn't. And the bad thing is, the ones that do all the work are the ones that are not profiting. 100 percent mike 100 i agree mike i agree with you mike entirely but i i, brian, I, I go just ahead don't get give, it. A, give a comment i uh, you know brian, brian i know you've got several different sites you work brian for, is so fine if careful. brian can't say anything brian will work around it damn it brian's a smart no dude. i i i agree <laughs> i mean that but that's a you know it's the same conversation everybody's been having for the past however many yeah. years that the ncaa Need some need some serious reform, and it kind of starts with reevaluating what the student athlete model is, and player compensation, and uh, player rights, uh, be able to benefit off their likeness, and, and so on and so forth. So it's not necessarily um, a, a new conversation, but it's something that, with all the FBI things that are coming out, I think it may spur some change sooner rather than later, and that's not a bad thing. Well, see, I think this, I don't think anything changes till people demand it. And I think the big problem here, Brian, Lucas, Steve, is this. Most of the people that go to Duke, they paid a lot of money to go to Duke. So they think, well, this kid's getting paid because he gets a free Duke scholarship. I don't think people realize, you know, we, we had this before about a year and a half ago when we had Mary from Mississippi Sports on to debate whether players should be paid or not. And... The thing is this, the first thing I thought about last night when they didn't show the replay on that play is not good. And the reason it's not good is because when I watch the NCAA and the way they work and the way they take advantage of people, I I just don't trust them. I mean, I think the NCAA is up there with Congress for who's the biggest crook. And the thing is this, when Mark Emmerich, comes out to uh, to give the trophy, nobody boos. That guy is more evil than Roger Goodell. And every NFL fan boos Roger Goodell because they know he's full of crap. But Mark Emmerich just gets kind of skate along because what they do is, uh, it's like last week when we tried to get a couple of the coaches on and we're told, yeah, they'll come on when the season's over. But right now, unless you have a contract that is paying the NCAA tournament, they're not going to be on. I mean, they control everything that happens here. And people could say, what was, it? what was it Bruce Pearl said people need to get over it on the bad call? He has to say that because if he complains about the officiating, officiating they'll find the hell out of him, Brian. I, I don't think Emmert gets booed because I don't think he deserves the booze. 
on it. Like he's not even worthy of your. Yeah, but uh, what I'm saying is, he, he's a scumbag. People should just like yeah. throw quarters oh, yeah. at him or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, not, he's just not. He's just not worthy of the effort it takes to boom. Um, yeah, I, well, it's just some serious reform is absolutely needed. Uh, I'm hoping that the FBI investigation can kind of spur some of that because we'll see people get punished um, doing something. Well, a lot of yeah, well, well, well okay, anyway. okay, Brian. Brian, here's the deal. The, the the FBI investigation is not investigating the NCAA. They're investigating mail fraud and money laundering. They're not even. Right. They don't even care about what the NCAA does. They don't give a shit what the NCAA does. So Emirate is free to do what he wants to do as usual. What needs to happen here is the presidents of the university is to to say, you know, we're getting a bad reputation here. And we got to fix this stuff. I mean, we're not looking good uh, in any estimation because there is nothing about the FBI that is involved with college basketball. They're only involved with money laundering and wire transfers and tax evasion and things like that. They don't give a damn about what's happening in basketball, uh, allegedly. Well, the you question know, is, is alleged. it so bad that they can't ignore it? Because my guess is they're going to try to say right. this has to well, do with they the have, shoe company. They have no jurisdiction. Yeah. Mike, they have no jurisdiction. They have no I know. Jurisdiction. Well, this is the thing. The I NCAA mean, so, has jurisdiction over anything that's done because they don't that's have jurisdiction. Yeah. yeah. I mean, come on. We've seen yeah. players suspended before. The one that got me was the player a few years ago to get suspended because his mom and dad were about to lose their house because the mom lost her job and they're behind on their payments. And there was Mm -hmm. the guy that coached the AAU team for the kid. I don't remember the kid's name. Maybe you do Brian or Lucas, but they, she asked for like a loan of 15, $1,500 a month. She paid it off within two weeks of getting the loan to save her house. They got a new job, paid it back immediately within a month and the NCAA suspended the kid for six games because his mom was taking money from his AAU coach. That's absurd. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the NCAA does a, a lot, a lot of absurd stuff. Yeah. And uh, the, the thing about the FBI investigation, excuse me, FBI investigation is that it uncovers things that uh, while being illegal with mayor fraud and corruption and all that stuff, constitutes NCAA violations, and uh, you would assume either the NCAA cracks down on it, which draws the reaction of, well, these players should be getting something anyway, creating some some reform there, or the NCAA does it nothing, which creates a whole other upswell of why aren't you doing anything when these are clearly violations of what you are saying you're upholding. Yeah, and Lucas, you're a North Carolina Tar Heel fan. Nothing was more egregious than what they got away with a couple of years ago. No doubt. No doubt. And I think that shows and us that nothing will be done. If that would have been Indiana State or Ball State, they'd have gotten a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah. For sure. And, but, I, and, and Mike, I mean, one, point, you know, one last point I'll make is this, is that, you know, why a lot of players go and you know go to the pros. I mean, a few years back, Shabazz Napier of UConn. You know, if there was a story that came out on him where you know there were some nights where he just couldn't eat. Yeah. And you know, it's just sad because I walk onto the court to do a live post game spot. I get to see the spectacle, and and you know, it's huge. It's amazing. But when you just stop and think about all of that. And the product on the court, which is why we cover the game. It's why we're talking on this show right now. And they don't get a dime. It's just sad. And the sadder part is I don't think it's going to change. No. No. They've got all the power. They're going to keep it. And my my, my theory has always been there needs to be a profit-sharing plan where you don't pay the kids while they're in school. You dangle a carrot in front of them to get their education because the NCAA wants to say it's all about student athletes. And so every year you work toward getting your degree, you get an amount of money put into a, a CD 
or something or uh, some kind of account that says if you graduate and get your degree, we'll give you this money. If you don't, it goes back into the general scholarship fund. You don't pay them while they're there. Why not? Uh, because th- th- that you don't. You just Why don't. Not? Because I tell you, I was a, I was a player at IU. I was well taken care of. I had all the health care I needed. I had food money. That's I, you not know, true, I, I though. Your, your health care had... was taken care of by your primary provider. The college does not take care no. of The college is, I, well, okay. But I can tell you what No, it, was. it wasn't at IU. I mean, I went to IU doctors. I went to Dr. Bamba. And every time I needed something done, Dr. Yeah, Bamba the team or doctor. Or what Dr. happened Green? if you got sick in August? Uh, I went to Dr. Bamba. Okay. Now, <laughs> let me tell Dr. you this. Do you, do you not think IU paid Dr. Bamba? Because all I know is this with my son when he just signed his letter of intent. No, I don't know, Mike. I don't think they did. Hold because on. Dr. Bamba and Dr. Rick wanted to be on the bench. Hold on. They wanted to sit on the bench. All right. They, now, no, see, you're, no, you're no, not letting me no, finish. You, and you cried like a little girl when I wouldn't let you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> No, just go ahead and finish. I, I don't want to interrupt you. But no, I th- thought no, maybe we you wouldn't pay. interrupt no, me. No, because Bamba and Rink, we All went right. to their offices and we we, we walked. We, I sat in front of a, a room of yeah. Well, then you got in the the, room. what you're saying is this: we you're saying right that they in. don't need to be paid in because they get great medical service, they get three meals a day, and they get a wonderful Indiana education. Because what you're telling me now is opposite of what you just said. Because before you said that they needed to get paid when they got out of school. I said when they're there, they're well taken care of. You get education, you get tutoring, you get scholarship, you get everything. But I think there needs to be a profit-sharing plan in place where for the money that's being made now for the universities – um, that every team brings in All right. from so the Big Ten. What network, happens if you're Zion network. Williamson? If you're Zion Williamson and you play for a year, you don't get anything. You get one year's worth of it. No, you don't get anything. Yeah, so, you go play in the okay. NBA. Oh, wait a second. You, you wait a second. In the NBA. That, that's messed up because Zion Williamson was the biggest ratings getter for the NCAA. He sold out every game he played at, and you're not going to give him anything because he went to the NBA to get paid. But the NCAA got paid for what he did. I still think you need to create a program where it's being a student athlete and getting your degree is more important than being an athlete. You can't do that. Um, you can't do that. Okay. There's too much money okay. for here to right. ever make them a student athlete because you know what? If they weren't a student athlete, they wouldn't need a tutor necessarily. They could just go to school all day like a normal kid, practice for two hours or play your game, and go back, go to bed, and do the same thing the next day if you really want a student athlete. So let's limit practice to two hours a day, and it has to be in the evening after classes. Then you have a student athlete. And 1% of all student-athletes that play college athletics go on to make a living playing in athletics. Exactly. I, 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 I so think that's the number. Why don't we so pay? The other 99% have got to go get their degree and, and do it that way. Yeah. Um, that's my thought process. So if a kid so. is not good enough to go play in the NBA, the fact that he got a free college degree and doesn't have to pay back a bunch of money, does that mean that he got his money's worth? It meant that in 1981 when I played. Yeah, I but we're not in 1981 when you played. We're in I know. 2019. Today, today, no. Today, no. Today, no. I think there's so much money being driven out of the championships and college basketball and college sports. No. They should be in part of the uh, profit-sharing plan. But you've got to dangle a carrot out to them to get their degree and do that. I don't have the answer. I'm just saying that's a process that needs to be reviewed by people a lot smarter than me. I know. All right, Brian, you want to tell everybody where they can find you? <laughs> yeah, you can, you can find all my stuff on bustingbrackets.com. A lot of great year-end wrap-up stuff up there and also previewing the offseason uh, or on Twitter at, at bralph33, B-R-A-U-F-33. 
All right, I'm thinking about changing the name of this West Side to Busting Balls. What do you think, Lucas? Where can we hear you? <laughs> At Lee Sports. It, it was a pleasure to cover the March Madness. And, yeah, a great tournament. Looking forward to the rest of the sporting calendar. April's a great month. you got the Masters, the NHL playoffs, the NBA playoffs. It's exciting. All right, Steve, you want to tell everybody where they can see a picture of your championship ring? <laughs> it's posted everywhere. Um, congratulations to Virginia, number one. Um, exactly. What a, what a what a thing for these kids. Um, it's a life altering night for these kids. I mean, their life will change, and they will have that and carry that with them for the rest of their life. They will have a ring. They will carry it with them as much as I do, and I'm a nobody. You told me you didn't uh, even have, have your ring. ring on you. You said your ring was like at the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. Yeah, it, it, yeah, but it, 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 it's still, you have one, and you move forward, and it's a life-altering moment. So good for those kids. Uh, I feel bad for Texas Tech. They they valiantly played. I think, I think Virginia won the game. I don't think Texas Tech – lost the game um i think this was a great game hey and let's put so it like yes forward. i think to put this in perspective um i've coached in like nine championship games from high school to the professional level and, and i've won six and i've lost three i don't really remember the six i won but i damn sure remember the three i lost mm-hmm. i mean that's there you go you know that's that's why yeah I am so pissed off when an official interjects himself into this. Because, as you said, and this is my final comment for today, it's a life-altering moment. You're correct. And when something outside of what your team is alters your moment and maybe completely changes it, I just think that's a problem. I mean... I know some people don't, but it's just to me, if I've worked my ass off my entire life to get to that point, to have an official make a call or to not make a call that is obvious right in front of them, I have a problem with that. Um, I think this, I think Virginia and Texas Tech, if they played 10 times, would be 5-5 five and five and probably 8 of those games would go to overtime. I think they were the two best teams in college basketball. I had a Duke fan named Mary who texted me something nasty or emailed me something nasty the other day because I said that the two best teams were playing. And Mary, I, if your team was better, they'd have beat Michigan State and they would have been playing. But they're not. And it doesn't matter that you beat Texas Tech in November because in the end, the NCAA tournament is about finding who was the best team at the end of the season, and that was Virginia. Texas Tech was the second best team. So we're going to wrap it up. Tomorrow we'll be back with Brian Hammonds, formerly of the Golf Channel, now has his own show in Indiana. There's also on thegrillingcrew.net to preview the Masters. And after about 20, 25 minutes, we're going to bring in Sam McGinnis, who is now our hockey writer, who will come on to give us a little playoff preview. That's for all those Canucks up there with Lucas in Canada. So you can check that out. Make sure you follow Brian Ralph at Busting Brackets. He does a great job. Lucas Weiss, all of a sudden this weekend, did a really good job, so he's really improved. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding, Lucas. But Lucas, I, are you get, Lucas, are you getting married? Lucas, are you getting married? <laughs> Lucas hung up on you. He's tardy or crap. Lucas hung up on me? <laughs> Lucas hung up on you. You just tossed him he's married. But, all right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Make sure you check out We Sports. Check out Busting Brackets and Fan Sided. So, I, for Brian Ralph, Steve Risley, Lucas Weiss, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>